Hi, I'm Joan Middendorf from Indiana University. Today I'd like to talk to you about decoding the disciplines and specifically about switching viewpoints. To students, what disciplinary experts do can look like rock climbing without ropes. But what they'd like it to look like is for learning to be more like rock climbing with ropes or at least with some kind of support. Decoding the disciplines is a theory about the gap between experts and novices. That's why we start with bottlenecks. We off and we often get asked about our bottlenecks, what's the difference between threshold concepts and bottlenecks? All threshold concepts are bottlenecks, but not all bottlenecks are threshold concepts. Threshold concepts are paradigm shifting bottlenecks. They're, and so they're very good ones, very important ones to focus on. But bottlenecks can also be emotional. They can be other kind of maybe not as demanding cognitive bottlenecks. They can be metacognitive. They can be a cognitive bottleneck like I need to write drafts of my paper, which doesn't really require a paradigm shift. Bottlenecks and threshold concepts both occur at step one of decoding the disciplines. They're both an analysis of the places where students get stuck. And then the rest of decoding the disciplines gives concrete steps for getting students through the bottleneck or the threshold concept. So what's the reason for these gaps between expert thinking and novice thinking or students and professors thinking? Experts find it difficult to describe their own expertise. Experts chunk and process their knowledge in larger units than novices. So it's like they can do a whole lot of things all at once, which then makes it hard for students to copy that. Today I'm going to show an example of getting students through a bottleneck, the bottleneck of switching viewpoints. This is a bottleneck that I'm going to show you what it looks like in history. Students find it difficult to leave their modern perspective and take the perspective and values of a person in a previous place or time. So that's what it looks like in history. But switching perspectives takes place in other fields. In English literature, it can be that students don't understand how to take the point of view of the author. And in sciences, it could be going from one paradigm to another, or like from Newtonian or to Einstein physics. Um, or it could be from everyday culture to disciplinary knowledge. Um, maybe, for example, if you're a polar scientist, um, you like to think of water in your science. And when students think about it, this is where they haven't switched viewpoints, they think of water as just being all the same in a bottle, like a bottle of Dasani. It's all the same temperature. It all tastes the same. Everything in it is the same. That's water from a student's viewpoint. But for a polar scientist, when they think of water up in Antarctica, where the poles are melting, they might think of water being like this. It might be more like polar sauce. Okay? The water is cold and clear at the top, maybe even icy. And then as it goes down deeper and deeper, it's, got, it's getting saltier and saltier, and it's getting warmer and warmer. And this is the reason that the poles are melting, because the, the carbon dioxide is warming the water at the bottom. And so when they keep talking about water, they're talking about this kind of water, not this kind of water. So there's a place where you have to get the students to switch perspectives in thinking about science. So we interviewed a polar scientist to, to be able to understand where students were getting stuck. So when we interviewed historians about, to go back to the history example of switching perspectives, and that's what I'm going to stay, the example I'm going to stay with today. The historian said that they try, when we interviewed the historian, they try to reconstruct why a historical person might have acted, acted or spoke, spoken as they did. So knowing that historians are constrained by their modern time and their modern culture, they do try to reconstruct the time and the, you know, what a person would have valued and believed and thought in the previous time period. Okay, so once we've gone through step one, we've found a bottleneck, students don't know how to switch perspectives, we've um, figured out what the experts do, they 
switch viewpoints, try to get in the time, into the kind of thinking of the person in the time period. Now, with the next step, we want to teach them this mental task. All the rest of the, the steps are about teaching them this mental task, this, the result of step one and step two. So step three, we try to model this thinking. First, we have to show the students how to do it before they can do it. And we start with a metaphor. A metaphor shows ex students exactly almost what mental muscles to use as they are um, trying to do this kind of thinking. And David Pace came up for switching viewpoints with, I think, a very nice metaphor. For switching viewpoints, it's like gestalt images. Can you see the two images here? You could see it as an old woman, or if you change your viewpoint, concentrate on a different part of the context, you might see that it's a pretty young woman. Okay? Here, do you see the old woman in this image? Okay? So this is a little like switching viewpoints because you have to decide which context to pay attention to, which details to pay attention to. So that's how we use, uh, here's, here's one more um, Gestalt image. How many legs does this elephant have? You kind of have to try some different viewpoints so you could count how many it has. Okay, so with Gestalt images, our brain organizes what it perceives and the decision on what to foreground can completely alter our viewpoint and what we're seeing. So to summarize step three, this modeling step, model with a metaphor, it shows us what mental muscles to use. Then you're going to use an example, you know, use an example from your field of that kind of thinking, you know, finding somebody's viewpoint from a prior time and in a text, and then be sure and highlight or use meta commentary about why you're doing and exactly what you're doing. Because from examples, students don't know what part of the example to pay attention to. Okay, so that's step three. Step four, now it's time for students to practice because we've shown them how to do it. Practice, we want them to try it out. So usually we want to give them a little bit of practice even if we can have them in another context, that can be good. And David Pace came up with this good example. He had his students practicing switching viewpoints. He told each team to pick a different fairy tale, whatever one they wanted, and think about it from, the, from a different um, viewpoint than they usually do. And we love the story of the students who picked Cinderella as their fairy tale. And they realized that really Cinderella was actually a story about feminism and that the reason the wicked stepmother was so mean to Cinderella was Cinderella was very beautiful and getting everything her way and easy for her in life because of her beauty and the wicked stepmother really wanted her to scrub floors and see what life was like for the rest of regular people. So that was what happened when they switched viewpoints and that was going to help them then when they had to take a text and practice finding the viewpoint of the historical person. And the historical person doesn't just say, here is what my viewpoint is. You have to read between the lines. It's implicit. You have to find it. Find what their values are. Find what's important to them. Find what their perspective is. Okay? So that's step four. You're going to take that mental task that's been broken into its component parts. You have to break out parts of it. It's usually a very complicated thing that the expert does all at once. And you can't do it just once. It has to be repeated. And then you reassemble the parts later on. Students also need feedback. They need to know soon and frequently how well they're doing and what they need to improve on. That's step four. Step five, there's lots to say about motivation. We've found two principles especially helpful. The first is um, that you want to disrupt classroom rituals. And we got this idea from Bob Bain who says that um, students are often, from all the prior schooling they've had, doing a lot of cramming for tests or writing papers or other assignments at the last minute. So anything you can do that gives them a different, unusual kind of an assignment, sometimes we will do something like have them make a poster in a history class, which is very unusual, some culminating product that's different, can get them breaking out of those last minute or just memorizing or just hurrying habits and get them to do the kind of thinking you want them to do on a poster for history, for switching viewpoints. Show us what the viewpoint is and what evidence you have to show that. That's all we want to see on this poster. Okay. Also on step five, 
The other part of motivation we find very important is to hold students accountable to their teammates or even if possible to somebody more than the teacher. To a public? Can you make something public? Can they have those posters hang in the in a coffee shop on campus? Because the more they're not doing it just for the teacher but for others, the more it makes them have to really do something very good, to do some very good work. Okay, so that's a short version of step five. Step six is assessment. And this is easier to do when we have a focus on the mental task, when we have a focus on the bottleneck, because we're going to assess that small thing, not a whole lot of other things mixed in with it. We've got a view on that one thing. So here's some assessment that we did of switching viewpoints in David Pace's class. The students had to, early on in the semester, week four, identify the values in Victorian championing of competition and what passages convinced them of this and then for the side for people who didn't like competition in Victorian times and what evidence the person had from the text that they were taking that position and then they did a similar assignment at the end of the semester and the results showed that students were able to take the viewpoint of the person they got a 34 percent increase you know, they, where they were able to show the assumptions implicit in the text so um, and more and more David thinks that the switching viewpoints is such an important operation in history. So that's how we got students through one bottleneck, the switching viewpoints bottleneck, a bottleneck that we think happens in many, many fields in different ways. So if we identify the difficult place and we figure out what experts do, show students how to do that, get them to practice, motivate them to perse perse persevere, then we'll be able to get them across the, the disciplinary chasm. Happy decoding.